Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so I'm extremely happy to introduce uh, uh, Mark Pollicott, uh, who will be our speaker at the, the Georgia Colloquium tonight. I know Mark since uh, a little while. I mean, uh, I uh, attended a very nice uh, school at the uh, International Center of Theoretical Physics in Trieste, organized by Caroline Series in 1989. And uh, uh, Mark was uh, uh, one of the uh, people giving courses there already. He was extremely young and uh, we we became friends uh, at that time. And uh, Mark studied uh, uh, in Warwick where he was supervised by Peter Perry. And then he has been in uh, various places, but mostly in Warwick. Uh, he has been in Porto and Manchester. And um, he's uh, a, a very prolific author. He has several, he has written five books. He has co-authored many other books and he has written papers. His focus is mostly on ergodic theory and fractal geometry. And uh, so somehow how things uh, come back to themselves either in time or when you scale, but I mean, uh, recurring in all possible ways. And um, uh, he is uh, a very, I mean, a, a remarkable speaker also because to my knowledge, he has never given twice the same talk, uh, which is uh, quite uh, an accomplishment. Uh, uh, for example, I always give the same talk. So, I mean, that's I'm a perfect uh, compliment of Mark. And um, uh, he has had many students and he has had a lot of impact and service to the community also as an editor of uh, various journals. And uh, we, we all uh, are very grateful to him for all these contributions, not only to mathematics, but also to the community in dynamical systems and fractal geometry as well. So thank you very much, Mark, for coming and please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very kind uh, introduction. Uh, so as Stefano mentioned, I, I gave some lectures in 1989 in Trieste. You should realize I was only five years old in 1989. Um, okay, so um, what I want to do is to talk about something connected with this title. I sent the title before I actually wrote the slides, so consequently I have to fit the talk to the title. Um, so when I talk about characteristic values, it simply means numbers. And these numbers are just numbers associated with different kinds of problems. Um, either in number theory or geometry, which give us some information, some insight into, into what we're interested in, in uh, doing. So I, I like when people come to my talks, but they go away with something, they, they get something. And since the mathematics is usually a bit ropey in places, I always give out chocolate. Uh, so this will be no exception. I will be distributing chocolate amongst the needy and <laughs> other people. It will increase your blood sugar levels and you may have trouble staying awake, but that's okay. I will speak louder towards the end of the talk. Uh, I gave it to, to Stefano because I know A, he likes chocolate, and B, he's a very efficient and well-organized person for distributing it. Um, okay, so this is a picture of the uh, Zeeman building. Uh, it's named after Christopher Zeeman, who was the founder of the uh, maths department uh, in Warwick. And so uh, the, the picture is strategically taken so that you don't see very much of the ugly buildings nearby. Uh, but it looks a bit like that. And since vanity, uh, my vanity is such that I can't give a talk without showing a picture of myself, um, we will probably see one if I get the slides to work. Uh, so here's a picture of me uh, talking to some local uh, guy. Um, okay, so uh, what do I want to, to talk about uh, in the next uh, slightly less than an hour, hopefully. Um, well, the idea is that there are certain circumstances where in mathematics you might want to uh, know a, a certain number, and this number may have some importance. So I spent many, 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 many years as a pure mathematician, and I never escaped from this. So the concept of actually working out numbers was never anything I really thought much about. But then there are certain circumstances where the numbers may have some interesting interpretation. Well, I should also apologize if there is anybody online or listening to the recording, there's no chocolate for you. Uh, if, you <laughs> if you meet me at some future date, uh, I will try to redress this problem. Okay, 
So what sort of examples might I be thinking of? Well, I want to think about two different kinds of numbers. Uh, the first is uh, I might have a set. And this set I'm going to think of simply as being some sort of cancel set in the unit interval. Nothing could be easier. And um, we want to say something about its size. And the cantor sets I'm interested in usually have zero measure, Lebesgue measure. So therefore, we need a notion of size. And so I'll, I'll talk about the dimension of the measure. So you have a cantor set, sits in the unit interval, and it has a size given by this notion of its dimension, which I will talk a bit more about later. This is just uh, an overview. So that's one number associated with one idea. And the second one, which is slightly longer to write down, is about matrices. So imagine that you have, say, uh, a couple of matrices. They might be these two matrices, so two, two by two matrices. And you can start multiplying them together. So if you multiply them together, then there are four ways, sort of, that you can multiply the two matrices together, pairwise. And that will give you four matrices. And if you multiply them as triples, um, it will give you eight, et cetera. And the thing you notice in this case is that the entries in the matrices are getting bigger. And if we define some notion of norm for these matrices, that would also grow. And so the idea is that the input here is going to be the two original matrices. And the thing we're interested in is how the matrices grow as we take more and more products in some well-defined way, which I'll get around to defining a bit later. So this is the second idea. So the idea is that we take a product of n matrices, which we can do in two to the n different ways. And then as n increases, we want to say that somehow these matrices are getting bigger in some way which is quantified by a certain number. So two different kinds of settings. In each case, there is a number which tells us something. In the first case, the number is the dimension representing the size of the set. And secondly, um, for these, these random products of matrices, there's a number called the Lyapunov exponent, which kind of tells you how fast they grow. So I haven't defined either of these concepts. I'm just introducing the, the names. OK. And so what do we want to do? Uh, well, what we'd like to do in each of these two problems is to estimate these quantities as efficiently as possible. So I, I'm, I'm given a, a, a cancel set in the interval. I'd like to estimate its dimension once I've defined it as accurately as I can, efficiently as I can. Efficiently means in my lifetime will be good, or maybe in half an hour if you're taking a coffee break while your laptop is computing something. Um, and uh, this is what we'd like to do. But more importantly, we want a number which we have 100% certainty is correct. So we, we write something down to a certain number of decimal places, and we say with absolute confidence but those decimal places are correct because we want to apply these ideas to something, to other problems where precise knowledge in pure mathematics is kind of important. Um, so we want to know they're really as accurate as we kind of claim they are, which would be good. Uh, question, who cares? Well, as I was just saying, the idea is that we want to apply these ideas. So here's a quote about accuracy, which has got nothing to do with mathematics whatsoever. And the claim here is that sometimes knowing these numbers has perhaps surprising applications to other areas, hence the two things in the title, number theory and geometry. So I have numbers associated to two different kinds of problems, and I want to somehow relate these to specific problems either in number theory or geometry. So that's my, my stall I'm setting out uh, for the rest of this uh, talk. Uh, if you're interested in the slides, they're actually on my web page. So if you um, Google my, my surname, assuming you can spell it correctly, but it seems to be stuck on almost every surface in this room, um, then uh, it takes you directly to my web page. And it says uh, pizza, pizza, a collo colloquium on it. And it's a hypertext link to these slides. Um, OK. So let me start off with the first one, which is about the dimension of Cantor sets. So these are pictures of uh, Cantor and uh, Hausdorff. Uh, one thing they, uh, well, they have several things in common, but one thing in common is that they came to rather sad ends in 
in both cases. Um, Cantor died of a, of a heart attack after spending several years in a sanatorium, and uh, Hausdorff committed suicide. Okay, but let's think of more happy things. Um, so I want to define a Cantor set, which will be interesting to study, and the way I'll do this is to use um, continued fractions. So uh, here's a statement. Uh, if you have any rational number um, between 0 and 1, then we can always write it as a continued fraction. We can write it as an infinite continued fraction in this way, where the a1, a2, a3, etc. are just uh, natural numbers. And all that means is that uh, it's the limit of these finite guys, where we just truncate the series. That's what it means to be an infinite continued fraction. And I use the uh, following notation. I'll just write a square bracket and write these terms inside here. Because otherwise, when you write it out in this way, these, the, the uh, subscripts get really tiny, and it's very, very hard to read. So I'm interested in looking at infinite uh, continued fractions, which, as we all know, are of this general kind of uh, form. OK, let's do that. And uh, here's a classical result, uh, which I looked up in a book I had since I was a student uh, called An Introduction to the Theory of Numbers by Hardy and uh, Wright. And it says, indeed, that for any rational uh, number, x between 0 and 1, we can find some natural numbers so that that value of x can be written as an infinite uh, continued fraction. Um, so this was in the book of Hardy and uh, Wright. So you notice here that uh, it's Sir Edward Wright. So uh, Wright actually had a knighthood, and, uh, and uh, Hardy didn't. Although Hardy was probably a slightly better mathematician, uh, they taught a course together um, in Cambridge in the 1930s, which is how they came to write the book. Uh, but Wright went on to become a university administrator, which is a surefire way to get a knighthood, apparently. Uh, proving great theorem, being one of the best uh, number theorists of the 20th century is not really enough. You have to be good at administration as well, or possibly politics. Anyway, so any, any irrational number uh, can be written in terms of natural numbers as an infinite continued fraction. Uh, but what we want to do is to define a Cantor set. And so if instead of looking at all possible values uh, of natural numbers, we say we restrict our, our expansion to only be the first m. So we fix an m greater than or equal to 2. 1 is a bad choice because you only get 1 point. Um, but if we choose uh, m to be, say, greater than or equal to 2, then it fixes a finite set, and then we look at all those numbers whose continued fraction expansion only has digits in that finite set. And we can do that. Why not? And um, the first thing is that it's going to be a Cantor set, which means it's homeomorphic to the standard uh, Cantor set, for example. And uh, moreover, it has, it's got zero Lebesgue measure, so it's a kind of small Cantor set, as Cantor sets go. And it sits inside the interval. And of course, the easiest case would be if we take m to be equal to 2. And in that case, it's simply all those points whose continued fraction expansion has entries which are only 1 and 2. So I'm just describing a way to generate some simple um, Cantor sets uh, in the unit interval. And this is done by looking at those numbers whose continued fraction expansion is restricted in some particular way. What could be easier? And these sets are zero Lebesgue uh, uh, measure. So what we'd like to say is if there's zero measure, can we say something about how big they are in a more general sense? So how do we distinguish between sets of zero Lebesgue measure? Well, one way is to define the size in terms of what's called their dimension. So unlike topological dimension, which is and you've got natural number values, this is going to be a real number between 0 and, and 1. And so there are two generally used notions of dimension. Uh, one is um, Hausdorff dimension, which is a very subtle invariant, which gives you lots of information, but has an awful definition, which is terrible to give in talks. And the second is uh, the box dimension, 
or the Minkowski dimension. And uh, I'm going to give that one instead, because in the case of the examples I'm talking about here, the two notions actually coincide. The Hausdorff dimension, whatever it is, is going to be the same as this simply defined box dimension. And so now I have a, a cancel set sitting in the unit interval, and I want to define its dimension, which by which I mean its box dimension. So why is it called a box dimension? Uh, it's because you take your cantor set, which in this case seems to be related, represented by 12 points. Cantor sets usually have more than 12 points, but I'm unable to represent it more accurately. So let's imagine this is a cantor set. And then we cover it by boxes. And in the case of one dimension, these boxes are just intervals. So for any epsilon, we want to see what's the most efficient cover we can take for this cantor set using boxes of some size epsilon. And I'll denote by n of epsilon the most the number of um, the smallest number of epsilon intervals we need to cover x. Easy. So I've introduced epsilon. I've introduced n of epsilon, which is the number. Clearly, if epsilon gets smaller, then n of epsilon is going to get bigger. I need more intervals to cover it. And indeed, the box dimension is the rate at which this grows. That is, the dimension is going to be uh, the limit. It's actually a limit in the examples I'm interested in, but in the definition, it's a limb soup. As epsilon tends to zero of the growth of the number of uh, epsilon intervals needed to cover uh, this guy compared with epsilon. And so the one over epsilon is here, so that this quantity turns out to be positive rather than negative, and that's the definition. So there is a definition. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about what it is, except that it does exist, and it's going to describe the size of a given set X. Different sets X will typically have different dimensions. And so we're interested in our examples, the Cantor sets given by these continued fraction expansions. We're interested in describing um, their, their, their dimensions. Uh, okay. And but those, everyone that's seen something about box dimension will know that um, if you take the middle third Cantor set, then it has a well-known value for the box dimension, which is log two over log three. The difficulty is that in our examples, the ones given by these continued fraction expansions with only digits restricted to some set, it's not possible to write down a simple closed form for the dimension. Hence this thing about computing values. Okay, so that was a, a warning. So let's go back to this previous example. So E of two is my Cantor set. This is the example where I'm looking at those numbers whose continued fraction expansions contain only the digits one and uh, two. And as I just said, there's no explicit expression for E of two. I can't write it in terms of pi, logs of, of two, three, or any of the numbers. It's just some number. Um, so therefore, you can estimate it. And in 1941, Jack Good uh, showed that it was in this range. So he got the first two decimal places. Uh, this predated um, electronic computers. Um, and here's some joke about Good's name, uh, which is it's quite good to do it for 1941. I'm actually wondering what happened to the chocolates. Did they stop somewhere? They should, they should actually circulate several times. <laughs> I'm looking to see if anyone looks guilty, but probably not. Um, and then some years later, there was an estimate by uh, Falk and Nussbaum, who, using some magic, uh, computed this to uh, 16 decimal places. And then it becomes something of a competition. as a sort of machismo thing where you want to compute it to as many places as you can. So uh, Oliver Jenkinson, who was one of my uh, students, and I computed it using a different method. You have to use different methods, otherwise your computer gets very tired. Uh, so we used a different method based on complex analysis and stuff. And we computed it to 100 decimal places. And then more recently, uh, Lena Vitnova, who was one of my postdocs, computed it to 200 decimal places. You might reasonably ask, who cares? Uh, well, <laughs> as I said, knowing it's 200 decimal places isn't necessarily useful, but it makes you feel better at the end of the day. A feeling of achievement is kind of important. So here we are. We're talking about these special Cantor sets and this notion of size, their dimension, and we can compute it 
to quite a lot of decimal places nowadays. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the method a bit later. I'll try and keep it as breezy as possible. Uh, but for now, uh, let me just say something about uh, Jack Good. I mentioned his name. So he was a student uh, at Cambridge. He was supervised by both Hardy and uh, Besikovic. Um, and uh, the reason it says good film news at the top is because he has a connection with movies. Um, so during the Second World War, just after his thesis, he worked, worked at uh, Bletchley Park in England, where a team of uh, mathematicians were quite busy cracking uh, German uh, communication codes. Um, and uh, there was a movie about this um, in 2014 with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, playing Alan Turing, and Jack Good uh, played, uh, well, didn't play in the film, but he was play, he appeared as a character, uh, and he was actually played by this actor. And in fact, he was also involved in movies in a different way, as a movie called 2001 A Space Odyssey, it's another classic, uh, and uh, Good was actually a uh, scientific advisor on this movie. So this is a picture from him on the movie set, and somewhere... It says 2001 on that box. There you are. Uh, does this uh, slide have any connection with the rest of the talk? No, you can just forget it. I just put that in. Okay. So I talked about the particular example of E2. E2 was the, the, um, the Cantor set where all the digits were one or two. Of course, you can do this for anything. So here is E5. So I take the digits one, two, three, four, five. My cancel set consists of all those real numbers um, whose continued fraction expansion has digits only one, two, three, or five. Again, it's a cancel set. Again, it's got zero Lebesgue measure. And you can ask what its dimension is. And uh, Oliver and I estimated it to eight decimal places using some messing around with complex functions and things. Uh, and then uh, more recently, uh, Polina and I um, improved it to 29 decimal places by using a different method, more efficient method, and which I'll talk about briefly a bit later. Anyway, so it's yet another example of one of these Cantor sets where one can compute these things to a certain number of places. So as I said earlier, who cares? I mean, you know, it's a number. Does it matter what it is? So who cares about computing uh, numbers? So let me try to bring in my defense um, the following. So here's a quote by uh, Isaac uh, Newton about computing pi to uh, 15 decimal places, where apparently he did it because he had nothing better to do at the time. Um, possibly I compute these numbers for the same reason. But in fact, there is some motivation for this, which I will now try to describe. Uh, and this is in connection with number theory. And so uh, it's not the Diophantine uh, 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 approximation stuff. It's to do with finite continued fractions. So, so far, I've talked about infinite continued fractions to define my Cantor sets. But I want to talk about a problem which is formulated in terms of finite continued fractions. Um, OK, so having mentioned it's about finite continued fractions, and since I'm giving a talk in Pisa, I have to mention Fibonacci, so I will. Um, and here the idea is that instead of uh, looking at infinite guys, I'm going to consider only a finite sequence of natural numbers. And in this case, we look at the finite continued fractions. So I have my n natural numbers, and I construct my finite uh, continued fraction in the same sort of way as I did before, except it's finite. And I'll denote this now in the same sort of way, except this square bracket will end at A of n. So this is a finite continued uh, fraction. What about them? Well, calling upon Hardy and Wright again, and their classic 1938 book, here is a result about finite continued fractions. And it says, basically, uh, if you have any rational number, also being the unit interval for this example, uh, it can be written as a finite continued fraction. So if you give me uh, a sequence A1 up to AN as natural numbers, and I construct this finite continued fraction, this guy, it's obviously going to be a rational number. I just kind of multiply through by stuff, and it becomes rational. And uh, the theorem says, uh, the lemma even says that um, for any rational P over Q, presumably co-prime, 
um, you can choose A1 up to AM with that property. So good. So what can we say now? Well, there's this thing called the Zaramba conjecture, which is from 1972, which says something slightly different. So here we have P over Q. So you give me um, any P and any Q, and I, can t I tell you I can find A1 up to AN satisfying this identity. But the Zaramba con conjecture says, well, if you give me any Q and I'm allowed to change the P, can I still choose a finite set of uh, natural numbers with this property. So instead of you giving me both P and Q, you only give me the Q. And I want to do this where the digits are restricted. So let me just rephrase that again. So the idea is that if you give me any uh, natural number Q, then uh, I can find a, a P to give me the rational P over Q and a finite sequence of numbers so that the uh, finite continued fraction gives me that rational P over Q, but I'm restricting myself to the A1 up to AN being between 1 and 5. So uh, I am restricting the, the, the digits I can use, but I'm allowing myself the freedom to, to choose any, any P. And this was a conjecture from 1972. This is the only picture I could find of Zaramba, which I think is from his university days. I think he was a bit older in 1972. Um, and this is the, uh, the conjecture. And this conjecture is still open. It's not known. Uh, you might wonder why 5 appears here. Well, this is for the simple reason that if you were to restrict A1 to AN to be 1, 2, 3, or 4, uh, then in fact it fails. You can find numbers for which it's not true. 5 is the first one for which it might be true and is conjectured to be true. OK, so there's the conjecture. Uh, you give me a Q, then I can find a prime, I can find a P, and I can find an A1 up to AN, a sequence here, which writes it in that way. And the conjecture is open, so what can one say? Well, one can say that it may not, we don't know if it's true for all values of Q, but maybe it's true for a lot of values of Q. And this is a, a result which uh, is due to a bunch of people, and it's what's called a density one result. So what that means is that it's going to be true for most Q in the following sense, in the sense that if I choose a lot of Q, so I, I choose some big value of Q, I look at the denominators little Q between 1 and this big value, and then I ask that the problem works in that case, that is, for each of these Qs I can find a P and A1 up to a, uh, AN, N can be anything, uh, taking values in here so that I can write it in this way. Well, I don't know if it's true for all values between 1 and uppercase Q, but if Q tends to infinity, the proportion of values of Q with this property, noted by the, the cardinality divided by Q, converges to 1. So more and more of these guys, in some sense, satisfy what we think is true. If the conjecture was true, then the cardinality would, of course, just be equal to Q, and we'd be in great shape. So it's a, it's a sort of fancy result. It was uh, proved, I think, in, uh, well, some version of it was proved in 2013. It's published in Annals of Mathematics. Uh, this is Bourguin. Uh, this is uh, Kontorovich uh, playing a musical instrument. And uh, the guy at the end is, is Hoang, who was a student of um, Kontorovich. Okay, so that's, that's it. So this is a problem uh, uh, about uh, finite continued fractions. What has it got to do with what I was talking about before? Hello. I, I think it's not known for any 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 number. Um, so in the original result of Borgan and, and Kontorovich, I think they had some number like 900 and something. So it would have been expanding in digits one up to 900 and something. So I don't think anything is known in, in, in other bounds. OK, so, so what has this, this particular problem got to do with anything that I've said before? Uh, and the answer is uh, basically uh, the following. That in their proof, it's conditional on the fact that the infinite continued fractions have a uh, Hausdorff dimension, uh, which is bigger than 5 over 6. So they have a proof. 
It uses some number theory. It uses something called the circle uh, method in analytic number theory, which involves some integration and stuff. And in, their, in the middle of their proof, they require knowing that some set, which in this case is E of five, this Cantor set, has Hausdorff dimension or dimension bigger than five over six. And of course, five over six apparently is 0 0.833 recurring, I'm told. And when you compute the uh, dimension using these formulas I mentioned before, you see that it's actually slightly bigger in the, the third decimal place. So it just works in this case. Um, so originally uh, in, in, in the thesis of Wang, he attributes this bound to uh, my, my good friend Oliver, uh, but he does it in a paper in 2004 where Oliver didn't actually have a proof of this. He was just kind of conjecturing it. So. But it is possible to prove these things. Uh, what I'm going to do now is very briefly say what the proof is. So this is a very good time to have another chocolate if you don't like proofs. Um, or maybe check your mobile phone. There's probably something important happening somewhere in the world. Um, but let me just say briefly what the ingredients are in the proof. So the idea is it's going to use some operator theory, as little as I can get away with. Uh, so these operators are going, to ask, uh, are going to act on some particular space. And this is going to be the space uh, of continuous functions on the unit interval, which is a perfectly decent Banach space. And what are these operators? Uh, well, they're going to be a family. So for every value of t between 0 and 1, I'm going to define an operator which takes a continuous function to a continuous function. Why not? And here's the operator. So what it does is it takes the function, let's call it f, it's a continuous function, and it evaluates the f at 1 over 1 plus x and 1 over 2 plus x. And it averages these out using a particular weight, which happens to be these guys. Why is this operator relevant? It just is. It works in the proof. OK. And so I've introduced this operator. And there's a result due to uh, this gentleman, uh, David Ruel, who uh, never had a beard when I met him, but he did apparently in this photograph. And here, uh, what he proved many years ago was that um, if you look at this operator, then its spectral radius, which is given by this limit, gives you some function, which is called p, so the limit of these guys. And if you plot this as a function of t, t changes, the operator changes, this quantity changes, and it's a monotone decreasing function, assuming I've got it the right way around. So that's, that's what he proved. What has this got to do with dimension? Well, there's another result uh, due to uh, Rufus Bowen and possibly his dog, um, which showed that, in fact, for this plot, if you wanted to work out the dimension of the, uh, the set, the set E2, then you simply look for the point on the graph where the value takes the value 1. And this is, um, again, calculation based on definitions, blah, 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 blah. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of straightforward, uh, if a bit mysterious. And so what we need to do is to show, uh, to find a value of t so that it's equal to this dimension, which is where the spectral rate of this operator is equal to 1. And in order to do that, um, we want to show, for example, that t, this dimension is in a range t0, t1. How do we do that? Um, so we want to choose show, show that it's in some particular interval. So what we do is we look around for to continuous functions on the interval, and we look for a function g, which has the property that when we take t1 and use that as the weight in this operator, then the effect is that every point gets lowered. So it takes a continuous function for this particular operator associated to t1. And then what it does is it lowers all the values. Let's say we found such a t1. And for t1, we found such a g. And similarly, um, given t0, to show this is a lower bound, what we want to look at do is look around to find a positive function f with this, this property that every point goes up, basically. So it's a very simple thing to check. And if you can check that, then it follows that the, the um, spectral radio of the two operators stand the other side of 1. And since the function is continuous and monotone decreasing, you end up with this bound on the dimension. So it goes in and out of a bit of operator theory and messing around. And that's what you come up with. Of course, there is a slight problem of finding these functions, uh, f and g. But you can do that by appealing to some numerical analysis where you get estimates. And this method here simply proves that the estimates you're using are really rigorous enough to, to do things. 
Okay, that's the end of the proof, good. Uh, so let me move on to something else that appeared in the title. So you can forget the proof, it's not relevant again. Uh, what I want to do now is to talk again about um, how uh, estimates on the dimensions of sets may have some relevance um, to problems in number theory, and in particular in this case to do with Diophantine uh, approximation. Yeah, sure. No, it just means you're lucky that you've got a value which is bigger than 5 over 6. Um, I, you, you can do the same game, not just with digits 1 up to 5. You can choose any subset you like and do the same game and, and compute the dimension associated to that limit set, to, to that uh, Cantor set. And if it's, a, if it's above 5 over 6, you get the same result. So if you chose more digits, then it would be a bigger dimension and you'd be, you wouldn't have to be so lucky. Uh, okay, so... so now we're back to Diophantine approximation. So this is a classical result due to uh, Dirichlet and one of the first examples of what's called the pigeonhole principle. So to prove that for any irrational number, you can always approximate it by irrational within 1 over q squared. Sounds great. Um, and I don't know why Dirichlet is leaning on a chair. Maybe that was something people did in photographs back in those days. Um, but of course, you could do slightly better, and there is a slightly better result due to Horowitz, um, which says more or less the same thing, except you can get a smaller upper bound where you divide out by 1 over root 5. So any irrational number, you can approximate it infinitely often by rationals p over q, which is now improved to this bound. Slight improvement, but... Replacing 1 by 1 over root 5 is an improvement, which sounds good. And so a natural question might be, can you further improve on these results? And the answer is not necessarily uniformly, but if you have different values of alpha, then you can probably replace root 5 by some other number. This is just number theory. And so in particular, if you have any irrational number, you can choose a value c, and I'll define c of alpha to be the largest value of c that you can slip in here, multiplying q squared, uh, so that this inequality is still true for infinitely many q. So we know that c will certainly be bigger than 1, in fact, bigger than root 5 by Horowitz's theorem, but for individu individual values of alpha, individually rational numbers, you can choose different values. And then this brings us to, uh, well, here's an example. Root 5 does occur for some particular value, possibly not that one, but something like that. And there is a, a definition. So if you take all the numbers you can get for irrational numbers, possibly in the unit interval, it makes no difference, um, then it's just a collection of numbers sitting inside um, the real line between root 5 and infinity. So it's a whole bunch of numbers. It's infinitely many irrational numbers. Each one you write down a C of alpha and take the union. That's it. And uh, this is called the Lagrange spectrum. Here's a picture of uh, Lagrange. Um, of course, Lagrange didn't define the Lagrange spectrum. It's actually defined by Markov. And so here's a picture of Markov. And you can ask the question, well, what does this Lagrange spectrum actually look like? So I've defined a subset of um, the uh, real numbers. They, I know that they're above root 5, um, and, but I don't know exactly what they look like. So, so do we have a description of this subset defined by these improvements on Diophantine approximation? And the answer is sort of. And so some, some parts of this, uh, this set um, are easier to understand. So we know it lies above root 5, and it goes off to infinity. So up to 3, then the set's only countable. And uh, Markov had a constru explicit construction on what the values you would get would be between root 5 and 3. It's an explicit thing. So, but it's a countable set. So what happens to the right of this? When can we choose the C to be uh, bigger uh, for different values of alpha? Well, another result uh, due to uh, Hall and slightly improved is that if you go far enough to the right, then every point appears. So uh, above square root of 21, which is some number, um, we know that everything is inside there. 
what we don't really know is what happens between three and square root of 21. So it's a subset of the, the real numbers. It's defined in terms of this uh, Diophantine condition, and it's a bit mysterious in the middle. So what can one say? Well, one could try to understand this by looking at this mysterious set between three and root uh, 21 by defining this quantity. So what we can do is we can take um, the interval between three and some value t, and then we look at the, the set, which will be a mysterious set intersection, the interval three up to t, and look at its dimension. Uh, here, a, here, h has appeared uh, to represent Hausdorff dimension because for this particular set, Hausdorff dimension isn't the same as, as the box dimension. But since I don't want to define the Hausdorff dimension, it's just surreptitiously appeared. So the question is, what can we say about this more complicated set? Well, it's described by the behavior of this function. So we have Diophantine approximation. It gives us some sort of subset of the real line. It's easier at this end, it's easier at that end, but in the middle it's mysterious. And we want to say something about how big and complicated it is by looking at this function. So we're taking three up to t, this interval, intersected with the complicated set, and we're asking how its dimension increases as, as t increases. And hopefully there's going to be a plot. Here's a plot, uh, sort of. And so you start at three, and as you move t to the right, it's going to be monotone, the set's getting bigger, its dimension is going up, and sometimes it's a bit flat because there are intervals in there which don't intersect the set, and sometimes it looks a bit more mysterious. Um, and uh, there's a result due to uh, Marrera, also published in Annals of Mathematics since one in 2018, uh, which says that this function is continuous. So there's no sudden lumps of the space, it kind of moves in some nice nice way, so the dimension of the set as, as, as t moves to the right as the set gets bigger um, increases continuously and uh, here's a picture of Marira. It doesn't really show his full uh, size but uh, <laughs> you have to guess that bit. Um, and here is a result which uh, is due to the same gentleman uh, Carlos Mateusz, uh, myself and Vitnova, which says well if, if this thing is increasing in dimension, um, when, does a, when does the dimension get up to its maximum value, which is 1? Well, clearly it would if we waited until we got to uh, t is square root 21, because then we'd see the entire line. But before that, you actually hit the value at 3.334, so it's like a, approximately a th one third past the value of 3, then the, set, the, the part of the set between 3 and that value is kind of big, in the sense that its Hausdorff dimension is equal to one. So this is just an interpretation of this set. And what's this got to do with the previous results? Well, the proof uh, uses approximations of this very complicated set, which is hard to understand, using things which are a bit like uh, these sets I defined before, which are called E of N. These, 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 um, these Cantor sets defined using just restricted continued fraction expansions. It's basically the same sort of thing. Um, prior to this, there were bounds by Hall, this picture of Hall, Marshall Hall Jr., uh, and uh, the same uh, Marrera, who showed uh, back, I guess, in 2018, that it was in this interval. So you see it's 3.1, and this is 3.4. So it's kind of a big interval back then. Um, so this is a slight improvement on that. And there was a conjecture by uh, Bumby from 1982, not, not backed up by any, any uh, actual proof, but it would be in this range. And indeed, it is in this range, and you can do slightly better. Hi. I, I think it has positive measure before you get to root 21, but I don't know exactly where it starts having positive measure. The set is very difficult to, to analyze, um, but it, it does have positive measure before you get too far. Uh -huh. Okay, so that was me talking about uh, Diophantine approximation. So let me use the remainder of the talk uh, just to briefly say something about the second problem, which was to do with uh, Lyapunov exponents. 
And this is for a random matrix product. So this is a picture of uh, Lyapunov, who has an extremely impressive beard, I always thought. Uh, and the interesting, uh, and, and sadly, yet again, he also uh, had a, a sad ending. He also committed suicide. Um, then there aren't many up stories in this talk, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just tell you a bit about these random products of matrices. So I mentioned on the first slide what we're doing. We're taking two matrices and just multiplying them together, say, in some, some way. So more generally, assume that I've got uh, D matrices. D might be two, D might be bigger. And I'll assume that they're square matrices, which are K by K. And then the idea as before was that we will look, so for some value of N, we'll look at all possible ways of multi multiplying together my, my matrices from this finite set. So if I have originally D matrices and I multiply them together uh, with N choices, I get most D to the N. I hope the calculation there is correct. So that's what I'm looking at. And what I want to do is to consider equally all of these products. So each of these um, d to the n matrices, I'll, I'll assume, has probability 1 over d to the n. What does that mean? Well, it means that I can associate my number, the Lyapunov exponent, in the following way. I take my d to the n different choices, so i1 up to i n are just these digits, and that's allowing all possible choices of n products from my family. I'm taking the norm of that. I'm taking the logarithm and dividing by n. So it's measuring the growth, the growth rate. So for a particular matrix, a particular product here, it's measuring the growth of the norm of this guy. You can take any norm you like. Um, and then I'm taking the average here over these choices. So it's a growth rate of individual products uh, averaged out over the d to the n guys. And this limit actually exists because of some subadditivity stuff. Um, you may wonder if, if this looks familiar or unfamiliar. It, it's, it's kind of very similar to what happens when you take an individual matrix and you just take powers of the individual matrix, take the log and divide by n. Then this will converge to the log of spectral radius. So there's some motivation for these things. So I've got a finite set of matrices, and I'm associating to this um, the, um, the uh, Lyapunov exponent. My, my watch is telling me my calorie limit has been hit. I'm not sure I know what that means. Uh, so um, if I'm given a finite set of matrices, how easy is it to compute this value of lambda? It's a number associated to this finite set of, of matrices. How will I, I compute it? Well. Here's a quotation for, from, oops, from Sir John Kingman, uh, who says, pride of place amongst unsolved problems of subadditive ergodic theory must go to the calculation of lambda. And indeed, this seems to be a problem of some depth. Uh, so Sir John Kingman was uh, also an administrator. He was a vice president, uh, as a vice, he, vice chancellor, which means president, at the University of Bristol, which is probably why he has a knighthood. Um, and here's a quote by Yuval Paris, um, who says it is now an excruciating problem uh, to try to compute these, these values. Uh, so it's probably not so easy. So let me give an example where D is equal to 2K is equal to 2. So I'm taking two matrices, and they're both 2 by 2 matrices. And it's the same example I, I wrote on the uh, first uh, slide. And so we do the same thing. We, we look at all products of two matrices, and we do it. And then we take all products of three matrices. And at this stage, we get a bit bored because it involves just taking products of matrices. But we can still associate this definition of the Lyapunov exponent. And in this particular example, one can compute it to some number of decimal places. And here it is. Uh, but one, of course, doesn't use the, the definition. The definition is a bit useless. One has to find some method to do it, which is very similar to this method we used to compute the, the uh, dimension. OK, and uh, it's slightly better than previous uh, things. So why would we, we care about the value of Lyapunov exponents? It's a, a very sort of esoteric problem. So let me give a very simple geometric uh, application. And this is as follows. So let's take a triangle. It could be an equilateral triangle. Looks equilateral. Uh, sitting inside the plane. So all the angles are the same. Uh, the next thing is we draw uh, median lines. So median lines are lines that go through the midpoint 
either side to the opposite vertex. So you do all three of these guys, and then due to some clever geometry, they, they intersect in the middle. Um, and then from the original triangle, I've now got one, two, three, four, five, six uh, smaller triangles. So the one here represents the level, and the one up to six just numbers the triangles in this particular case. So all I've done is start with a big triangle. I've got smaller triangles. And we can keep repeating this. So each of these smaller triangles, I can subdivide into uh, six even smaller triangles by taking the midpoint of each side, drawing a line to the other uh, vertex. And we carry on iteratively, and we get smaller and smaller triangles. And so here is a, a picture. So if we started off with this triangle, we divide it into six, then we divide it into 36, and then we divide it, subdivide it more, and we get more and more triangles. And we just keep on going in this way. And the question you can ask is, what is the shape of a typical triangle uh, at the nth level as n tends to infinity? So here we started off with an equilateral triangle. But as you go into the picture, more and more of these triangles seem to be kind of flattened or distorted in some particular way. And so you'd like to say something about that. So after four iterations, you get this picture. And you might imagine that they seem to be degenerate, i.e. becoming very much like intervals, flattened in some particular way. Um, and then the question is, well, does that happen? And if so, can you quantify it? And the quantification will come from the Apanoff exponents from something. OK, so we take a triangle. We're generating more and more triangles by this, this process of just dividing the triangle into six smaller triangles in a very simple geometric way. Uh, so here is a, a quantifiable way to do these things. So let's imagine that uh, this is a triangle at the nth level, and x is just a typical point uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure on the in initial triangle. So we choose our point x in the triangle, and we look at the particular nth level triangle containing it. And for this nth level triangle, I'll let theta n of x be the largest internal angle of this triangle. So the angles are meant to add up to pi, or 180 degrees if you're old enough. Uh, and degeneration will mean that this angle will get closer and closer to pi, or 180 degrees. Um, so typically, what should happen is that, the, that as you go further down, looking at more and more of these triangles, which are around the point x, we expect them to degenerate. And indeed, the claim is that for almost all points, we have that the largest angle for the, for the sequence converges to pi, degeneration in some, some particular uh, way. And the question is, how fast does that happen for a typical uh, point? And this was uh, studied by uh, these three gentlemen. So this is Barani, whose accents are missing in his name, probably, uh, Beard and, and Khan. And they showed that, well, the angle theta to the n of x for a typical point x, as you look at the smaller and smaller triangles in which it's contained, uh, well, the maximum angle does can, can go to pi. It does it exponentially fast, which means that you take the log of this divided by n, it converges to something which is smaller than 0, which I've called minus 2 lambda. So you get this exponential degeneration of these triangles. And what happens is that this value of lambda is, in fact, a Lyapunov exponent for some matrices, using my previous definition. And the idea is that there are six matrices in this case, all two by two. And we define the Lyapunov exponent by taking random products of these and looking at the definition. And what's that got to do with the original problem? Well, the six matrices are because we're taking the original uh, triangle and we're mapping onto these six smaller triangles by affine maps. So affine maps means that you distort it by some matrix, one of these six, and then just translate it and plonk it in the right place. So these six matrices are what are controlling the distortion at each level of these, these guys, um, as it just says there. And then we write down this Lyapunov exponent. So this should be the definition I gave before. And then the value of lambda you get there is just telling us how quickly these triangles degenerate. So it's a simple geometric application of this uh, problem. And 
the value of lambda, well, uh, this this problem was was rediscovered by Diconis and McMullen. Uh, they hadn't found the original paper of uh, the other three authors, so they rediscovered it. And there's some unpublished note by McMullen uh, talking about these things. Um, this guy uh, had an estimate on lambda. Uh, he showed it was in this interval and guessed that it was about zero point zero seven one. Um, uh, Amy Wilkinson has an article in uh, the AMS from 2016 where she has a, la a value of lambda which is not in this interval. Um, so I suspect it's probably not quite right. And uh, we estimated it to be in this range. So it's not quite this, but it is certainly in this, this range here. So this value of lambda here is a numerical value that tells you something about how the shape of these triangles in this, this construction are degenerating. So it's a sort of application. Uh, so this is the exciting part. So I now have two hypertext links, uh, one of which says skip to uh, another application, the other says skip to the end. Uh, so I was gonna click on skip to the end, but I don't know if the mouse works on this. Maybe it does. Uh, and so here's the end. So uh, this is the penultimate slide. Um, so I mentioned before that there was this work by Jack Good from 1941, um, who had an estimate on the household dimension of his Cantor sets called E2. Uh, well, 49 years later, he uh, had another mathematical uh, contribution, uh, which is perhaps more general, uh, which was uh, an estimate on how long a research paper should be. And so he has this formula that says that uh, it should have at most uh, 10 to the nine times PX over two words. So if you write a research paper, this should be its maximum length. Uh, X is uh, this value X here is the importance of the topic. I'm not sure who decides that. And this, the, the value of P is uh, what he calls the bakedness of, of this. Uh, so for those of you who, who, who are not familiar with the word um, partly baked uh, in mathematics, in English, there's this notion of half baked idea, which is defined to be one which is poorly developed, foolish or unlikely to work. So presumably in your research paper, you'd like P to be bigger than a half. So um, that's, that's the, the uh, contribution that Jack uh, Good made. Uh, and so, for example, if you had an article of about 20 pages, which might be 6,000 words, and if it was a perfectly developed idea, P is equal to one, uh, and it had an importance, it would need to have an importance factor of 0 0.83, whatever that means, to satisfy this formula. Otherwise, it would be a completely useless paper, presumably. Um, and I was going to check my own papers uh, for this, uh, but then I chickened out and just said that it probably doesn't apply to most of my my papers. And in fact, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, so questions? I know you quoted the... Someone saying accuracy is everything. Uh... Time is not, but how long does it take to get, uh, say, 200 decimals on, on the first estimate you gave on, on a laptop? So just out of curiosity. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't nowadays take so long. So as I was saying, the, the improvements are, are not so much uh, due to uh, having a bigger computer. They're all done on laptops, in fact. Um, but it's due to the fact that we keep finding better ways to do it. Um, so I think that the estimate for 200 decimal places, it takes less than, than 12 hours. So um, my, my definition of a long time is I set the computer, go home, come back the next morning, and I want it to have finished because I'm fed up by then. So uh, the, the, the way the algorithm works is it, it keeps generating better and better rigorous approximations. And then after a hard night's work, when I'm sleeping, um, it gives an answer which happens to be accurate to 200 decimal places. Sure. Yeah. So when you 
you work with extended precision and so on. So there must yeah. be a way to validate this calculation. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. you cannot claim that they're accurate. So how do you validate the calculations? Oh, well, I, I have a very simple system. I hire postdocs who are very good at this sort of stuff. Um, so, so I understand how the algorithm works. And then my, my postdocs um, set up the programming for me. Uh, so in fact, uh, I think the original uh, estimate... Um, was done in programmed in Fortran, and indeed it uses um, what I used to call interval arithmetic, but now is called I think ball arithmetic or something. There's some other terms for it. So um, what happens is that it, it it carries out these estimates with very high precision. Um, in fact, the the hardest part is the is is the fact that when we do the good estimates for 200 decimal places, we use what I described before, where we have to find functions that do something functions such that the operator makes them smaller or bigger, which is fine. These, these, these functions turn out to be polynomials of degree about 200, so they're not that big either. Um, but the difficulty is actually showing that one function is smaller than another. That's technically the hardest part. But since everything is analytic, we do it in terms of critical points, and that's easier to control. But if it was a more complicated thing, I think the hardest part of the problem will be to actually check that condition. Because you have to do it to lots of decimal places as well. So let me do some advertising for, uh, I'm not an organizer, but there will be a, a workshop in school on uh, rigorous computations in problems in ergodic theory and dynamics and related topics in June at the, the Georgia Center. One of the organizers is sitting over there and and one of the speakers is sitting mm -hmm. over here. No, standing over here. And uh, um, okay, so the, there's a there's a lot of activity in dynamics uh, and also in PISA, thanks to Stefano and others uh, on in the field. Okay, I I, I think I can provide a, an answer to the question you asked. I think I know why Dirichlet was standing. Uh, and keeping his hand on a chair because those were long exposures. Those were old photos and it took several minutes to get the photo done. So people were <laughs> keeping the hand not to not to get the picture uh, fuzzy. I wondered if it was the same problem I have, which is I, my knees are not very good. So I need to lean on things if I'm, people are taking photographs. Okay. okay, so there are other questions, but we will ask uh, later. Okay. Thanks a lot again, Mark.